And to like, and when we talk about playing the long game, I think, you know, you brought up a conversation, we brought up a conversation earlier about like, I think you have to think about yourself as a person who has kind of three parts. You have like who you were growing up when you were a kid. And then now you got who you are right now. And then you have to, you know, you also have who you will be like, and I think that you have to honor all three of those things. Yeah. And so like, um, it sounds stupid to a 20 year old to say, Hey, you know what? Maybe just start, just think about starting an IRA. Just think about it. You don't have to do anything with, don't put a lot of money into it. Maybe 25 bucks a month. Just think <laughs> about it. It's not a big deal. Right. Because, but that's so far away. Cause you're like, Oh, well, shit. I, you know, I've got 50 years before I retire right. and, but that's going to, and then you're going to be like, but if you honor your, if you honor who you would be in the future, honoring your future self was kind of how my father-in-law would put it. Yeah. You would, you you make choices like that. Or like, I think we talked about like injuries and athletics and stuff. Athletics will not always be playing. Athletics will not always be a central part of your identity, or it will be very rare. Mm -hmm. And especially at the, at, at, it may always be a part of it in that you like, you might always coach or you might always play like adult league, or you might always play this, but like high level athletics are going to stop at some point. Your body is going to say, it's all I got. Yeah. And, and that's okay. You, You know what I mean? And if your identity isn't entirely caught up in like that part of you, if that is if that is an important part of a larger whole, I think that's a much more important thing than you know than saying I'll only be happy if I am on this team doing this thing. Uh, because you can almost guarantee that even if you are on this team doing this thing, it's going to be different than you think it's going to be. Oh. And that may be better or worse or, and I think, you know, maybe pleasant and unpleasant would be a nice, a better way to think about it. It's not bad or good, but it's just it's, different. It's going to be rather unpleasant. Yeah. That's a good word. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, three days starting at 530 is a lot different than high school soccer, right? Ooh, tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole lot different. Uh, but that's not. But I think there's a lot, there's also a lot of value in like putting a lot of effort into one thing yeah. and learning about yourself while you're doing it. I think that's amazing. And if that's like six hours, like aiming at a, I, one of the guys that I used to coach with, Zach Craddock actually, yeah. uh, said that he used to spend hours and hours in his backyard with his soccer ball and he'd aim it at a point on the fence. And that's what he would do for hours. And I think like the discipline you learn as an athlete is very similar to the discipline you might learn as a musician, where you're just like working on the fundamentals all the time. And there's a lot of value in that that will translate further on, whether it's like catching a ball or kicking it or just like the kind it's almost like a like playing a very active form of yoga (laughs) you know like you're just thinking about like where you strike the ball and thinking about the best way to do that I think there's a there's an incredible amount of value in doing that yeah and I love that Um, you said that about talking about discipline because it's something we talk about all the time is like okay teamwork discipline cooperation like all of these things that you learn as a student athlete like future employers are like yeah you have those skills because I know you were part sure. of a team and you've already experienced what's that like of like wins and losses. Right. And it's yeah. so valuable. And so I even want to say, because we share on the show, only 7% of high school athletes go on to play their sport in college, no matter what level from junior college all right. the way to division one. Right. But what I want to remind our parents and our high school students who are listening is that all of those skills learned through athletics in high school translate so much 
yeah. into future life. And for us to not sh- like take that away. No, gosh, I, I think I think one of the things that I did maybe understand then that I do now is that discipline and freedom are not opposites. Right. They're actually like pieces of bread on the same side of the sandwich. You know, like they're just are the opposite side. You know, like when you are disciplined it gives you the opportunity to do more things and so i figure if i go to sleep at the same time and wake up at the same time and i have my day kind of mapped out in front of me i'm not at the whim of whatever happens to be on the computer yep i'm not a slave to what's on my phone i'm not And so there is a freedom in that discipline. And I think like I get up every morning and I exercise. That's a discipline. I could be doing anything else. And there's a certain like pull of like, oh man, I should stay in bed, you know, or whatever. But I think I'm 50 right now. I'm with any luck, I'm going to be 70 or 80 or 90. And I want my body to work and at that time and I get to decide that now yeah you know I mean 80 is a bad time to start running yeah well and I think that goes back to how you were talking about like thinking about your past self your current self and then like that future self what a great analogy to say like this is what it could look like right yeah and I mean like yeah think about how we we all have to make sacrifices in order to do the things that we want to do. And you have to take a legitimate look at the sacrifice and saying, well, is this worth it for me? Yeah. And is this worth what they're asking or is this worth? And, and I always used to think about colleges as being kind of like buying a car. Like they're not doing you a favor by letting you in you're doing them a favor by coming or even better they're both of you should get benefit you know what i mean like i i you know i don't it's hard like we had so many kids from from douglas who went on to great ivy league schools and stuff and it was just because they just threw their name out there yeah and they were like, I want to go do this. And then somebody said, all right, well, let's, let's do it. Um, and then there were other kids that chose to stay and neither of those kids are making bad choices. Yeah. As long as like they're being consistent internally because like what causes stress in your life later and you know, all, all through your life actually, but, but it becomes much more apparent later is that when you are living outside of your for for lack of a better word like your values or morality or who you are like when you are not in alignment with with that that's what causes the stress yeah and and some people may be like super happy like college athletics or college anything or or not college right like i'm in a job right now that did didn't require college at all except for my communication skills with my customers and stuff right and so like on one hand I didn't need the college but on the other hand without the college I wouldn't be doing this right right and And so so yeah to talk about because you also said something about like making those major decisions and I think about yeah I played at a junior college for two years I knew right firm well at the end of that, after that last game that I was not playing anymore. Right. And I knew that because my body told me that. Right. It wasn't that I wasn't recruited for another school. It wasn't that the coach didn't say, Hey, people want to talk to you. It was simply for the fact that I said, I physically, if I continue this, it is not going to end well. I'll be good. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's such a valuable conversation to have too for kids. I mean, because that might be the decision these kids make their senior year of high school. 
right. based off of their body. It might be the decision that they're like, you know, I need to transfer. I need to right. do this, like whatever it is. But without sure. that experience, without those things that have happened, I wouldn't have been educated enough to say, nope, I'm done. Well, you know what? I think also that brings up a really interesting thought that for me and something that I struggle with now, but your, your worth and your identity are not tied up in what you happen to be doing at any given point in your life. And so like your dignity as a human being is not in any way tied up with whether or not you play sports. Yes. That's something you bring with you. And I think the people that are the best at anything, at anything, I mean, if you're talking about like Yo-Yo Ma, or you're talking about Zidane, or you're talking about like people who have that just like next level um, awareness, those people, their dignity doesn't their 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 love of themselves i don't think when they're the most comfortable doesn't ride on whether or not they are a football player or a cellist or whatever that stuff comes before and then they're all of their skills are built on top of that internal dignity that internal like stability of like It took me a long, I struggled with this for a long time. I still do kind of, but like what I'm starting to realize as a 50 year old man with a successful business, right? um, Is that my worth doesn't come from, is is already there. It's not a part, it's not about, I'm going to be worthy of love and belonging. You know, um, it's funny. I listened one of the books that I listened to that really kind of changed my um, perspective on this was I listened to a series of talks by uh, Renee Brown yep. called "The Power of Vulnerability." Yep. Liz, and she said essentially that people's like feelings of love and belonging, the only variable is whether or not people think that they should love and be val- think they are are worthy of love and belonging not whether they are or not Mm. and so like the only variable to love and belonging was whether or not you thought you deserved it and that made a huge impression on me because the the enemy of that was actually was really interesting was fitting in so people who tried to game and tried to fit in didn't felt like they always felt like they were frauds I guess or something but they never felt that like internal consistency but when they showed up to the game and they knew all right this may be okay for this we may be a good fit we may not be a good fit but it's going to be okay either way those were the people that experienced their best and I think like if I had anything to give my younger self or anybody younger now or older, anybody really is that that idea of just like starting out at that place, start out with like, you're okay. Yeah. And that doesn't mean like, if you're being a a contemptible human being and taking advantage of other people, that that's okay. But most people who are doing that, you like how I avoided the cuss word there. It was Um, was real good. (laughs) But most people that are doing that don't feel okay about themselves. They're doing it because they're trying to prove something to themselves. And the people that I've met and most admired in my life have a kind of interior peace and calm and stability that comes from that, like knowing of how, like just knowing yourself, that quest of knowing yourself. And that doesn't mean indulging yourself. And it doesn't mean, you know, there's so many things that that doesn't mean, but like, I don't know, it's just such a cool, important thing, you know, like you spend all your adolescent years, like in this like soup of like trying to figure out who you are. And you've got all of these people in your ear saying, you got to wear this and you got to do this and you got to like this kind of music and you got to, and then you get to college and that spectrum becomes much wider, but it's still a, 
you know, I, I don't know. It's really, it's just super interesting. Like our relationship to ourselves and our relationship to other people is such an interesting thing. Yeah. And I think there's such, we learn so much about ourselves by learning about other people, but the danger is we try to be like other people so that we can get that feeling of being accepted and being like belonging somewhere and, and being loved and and that's not how you get that yeah you know what i mean you you bring that you bring that to the party um and that's such a i mean you know what i mean oh i know like, what you mean like i i might, ride this way with you and i'm like wait am right. I back? like am i back at coffee high sitting in the classroom <laughs> with the wisdom rating down like what's happening yeah it's like, I'm, it's I like mean, teleported but you get that, but there's this like sense of like, I don't know, like there's this sense of joy and freedom that comes with that piece of like, yes. I might get, you know, like I might catch this ball or I might not, but I'm going to damn sure try. Yeah. And yes. if I miss it, it's not a referendum on whether or not I'm a good person. Right. Yes. And oh. the athletes that I've coached that, and the, the kids that I have known who have just laid it out there and sometimes they get their ass handed to them. And then sometimes, and you will, and you will, you do, yes. you know what I mean? But like, I don't know. There's just something really neat about a person that's just willing to just try. Yeah. I think a lot of us end up at mediocre because we're trying to figure out whether or not we're okay yep rather than trying to do the thing that we're trying to do like the question is not how good a uh, athlete could i be how good a musician can i be how much can i learn about this thing how much joy can i get out of this what you come to and you're like you're constantly sort of asking a question like am i okay and that's the wrong question to be asking at that point and in my in like it's sort of my view of like when i look back I, like the people who were okay and then became athletes or so, you know like were content um not necessarily content with their current like i think there's always this push and pull between like i want to get better like even even now as a 50 year old man i am trying to be a better cellist i practice almost every morning for 30 minutes to an hour uh and i work on real basic stuff and you know i've got a quartet concert that we're going to do at the end of next month and you know i'm kind of pushing myself and pushing myself i'm never going to be yo-yo ma but i can be as good as i can be yeah. and i get a lot of joy and contentment out of that you know and that's i i don't know i think that's and I'm a knife maker for crying out loud, right? <laughs> right. right. And, and a I former mean, coach and English teacher. Like, come on. And a coach and English teacher. <laughs> but I mean, I, that that struggle, that is a lifelong, like something that you're going to do over and over again. This is like, you're not, like you, you're in the process of like learning who you are. You're not in the process of like trying to like nail down like this, mm -hmm. this it doesn't ever stop like that growing never stops oh, and if it does stops. stop then it's then you're in a lot of trouble yeah yeah oh a thousand you're in a lot of trouble yes. yeah you're stone in the stream at that point it's no good you know i mean i am a different man than i was when i was 24 and coaching girls soccer in coffee county but i'm also the same man Right. And I'm glad that I was that person. And I'm glad that I am this person. And it's going to be real interesting to see what's going to come next. I mean, maybe I'm going to get an RV. I <laughs> you mean, know? you totally can get an RV and travel yeah. the world. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know how helpful this is, but I, I'm, I'm just thinking like, I, there are so many people who are so worried about you when you're in high school and and then like you know clutching the pearls you know and like if you just i mean work work hard but like take it easy because you're it's a long ride and if you're clutching the if you're clutching the uh 
the uh, armrest the whole time and white knuckling it, it's not going to be as much fun. Oh, no. You know what I mean? I a thousand percent know what you mean. Yeah. I mean. And I think that's like such great advice to you for the parents who listen of just saying like, hey, you're along for the ride too. Like, you know. Right. And that's so, so important. So, well, Van Wyke, you know, the podcast yep. is called Confessions from the Sidelines. All right. And I'm oh, ready yeah. for this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what you're going to say. So I'm going right. to hear this. But what's your favorite memory from standing on the sidelines? All right. So I thought about this a lot, actually. Um, and there is a moment that sticks out to me from when I was coaching in coffee. And we were not in the wins and losses department, super successful. No, that's a guess. That's accurate statement. That, that is an accurate statement. I think you did some homework and there was some, I did there a little some, bit of math. did some math and there were some tough, tough moments, but there was this one game in Tifton and you, I think you remember this game. Somehow or another, we snuck a goal in. I can't remember. And they were the best team in the whole, you know, like they were everybody. And we won that game one nil. And I, I like, it was the most important thing that happened to all of us. And I remember the other team was just, they must've been like shell shocked because it was like, just what like, what just happened? Weird. Like this was not supposed to happen. Right. <laughs> it was, it was almost like, it was like our version of Appalachian State being Michigan State. Yes. It was like, you know, yes. and I still, I remember having scored that goal. I think it might have been a penalty kick or something. Somebody buried one. I think it was Milligan. Oh, yes. I think, I think, I think, I think exactly it might have been, right. I think yep. it might have been Emily Milligan. And I remember when the whistle blew, she was still working to get that ball up the field and away from our goal. Like it was hopeless to score at that point, but they were pounding our tails trying to get a goal in to tie it up or do something. And like everybody, like there was that group thing where collectively everybody just like dropped into it and decided that this was the way it was going to be. And we didn't get scared and we didn't. And I mean, like that was, that's a moment that I remember that was just absolutely incredible. And I remember I still, so at, at the banquet that year, you guys, Tifton's team colors were blue. And so you guys gave me a bunch of blue stuff. Yeah. Like, like, I think you guys gave me a big blues clues doll and some other things, <laughs> but I still have the blue trash can that y'all gave me with all your names on it. And the, the score of the game. And like, I can't, I'm going to keep it in the basement. And it's got my, like uh, some of my, like Bo Wood, that's another story yeah. together all together. But like it's down there. And I and I saw that and I've kept that with me. And that was just like an example to me of like like you guys were scrappy. We weren't that's the actual adjective to use. Right. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is like scrappy is good. Scrappy sc scrappy will get you a lot. You may not be the best soccer player, or the best athlete in the world, but if you're scrappy, it'll get you somewhere. You know what I mean? And and that just like that was that was great scrappy for me. And like I remember another game, and I guess maybe I'm violating the rules here, oh, but no. like we always there's always a few people who have a couple of favorites. Well, there was another game where we played. I don't and I don't know if you I think you may have been on this team or maybe not um but we played in Lowndes and Lowndes was the other like completely powerful team and we played them zero zero to something like the 
88th minute. Oh, it's probably one of those, one of the seasons where we played overtime at least 50% of the season. And I mean, they were supposed to beat us six or eight, nothing. We played them zip, zip. And I think it was Kara McKinnon that was tending goal at that point. And like, she just had a game, like the game of her life. Um, and we got a breakaway at their goal. And we didn't capitalize, which is fine. And then their keeper kicked, punted it to somebody who kicked it to somebody else who buried it in the back of our net. And we lost the game in the last, I don't know, 20 seconds or something. But that, I, I was super proud of everybody then too because of the scrappiness. Yeah. It wasn't like, like that stuff happens, but they were just, there was just this like, yeah, I was super sad. We were all sad, but I remember sitting down with everybody and saying, I cannot be more proud of you than I am right now. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with whether or not we won or we lost in that last game. And I, 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 I don't know. I mean, that was those two moments were the moments that kind of stuck out to me the most of things that like I've seen great goals we've had a lot of games where we were very successful you know uh, we've we won when I was at Oconee we won like lots of region championships and that kind of stuff but I've never forgotten the scrappiness of that group of folks yeah and I mean that's that's that was worth the price of admission for me you know which what i mean also free. <laughs> which is also free right well it was free except for all the time that we had to put in it and all that's the you know the blood sweat and tears that's and right. driving at three o'clock in the afternoon in a hot bus on the way home you know all that stuff but i mean yeah I mean, it really was awesome i i just remember those times and i like i could not have been prouder or more uh, content with the amount of, of effort that we put yeah. in. Yeah, oh. that was great. It was so good. Thanks for taking me yeah. down memory lane for a second. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, so everybody that, knows surely that didn't catch you off guard. <laughs> no, I kind of I expected we were going in that direction, but at the same time, I never know. All right, all so, right. Well, yeah. Well, we've talked a little bit about like that. You're a knife maker now, so I want to make sure right. everybody knows where to find you guys. For Bloodroot Blades, um, we'll post in the comments. I'll post the link to your website. And then also yeah. you talked about your wife, Katie. She manages the Instagram side of things on social media too. Right. So you'll be able to connect everybody there as well. Yeah. Well, awesome. thank you for having me on. This is oh, really this is fun. so much it's... fun. Absolutely yeah. enjoyed it. So thanks again. Well, yeah, it's I'm, I'm so proud of what you have done and what you've become. And this is a neat thing. It's neat to see all that you've done. Thank you. That's really cool. Well, I so, so. appreciate that.